our NPO Grow webinar series today. Today we are joined by an interesting panel. Um, they will be just discussing uh, accelerating growth and pivoting during COVID-19. Uh, I thought this topic was so fitting, especially in the times that we are living in at the moment, as more and more organizations have been working tirelessly to search for new and innovative ways to create growth and pivot during COVID-19. Uh, my name is Yue Zangana from, from Kuala Women. And Kuala Women was co in 2018 with the purpose of bridging unemployed and important topics that are useful for within the nonprofit space. So today I thought it would be really amazing to bring together leading voices within the NPO space with the idea to connect, share ideas and share insights and hopefully find inspiration in, in each other's stories. So today I've had the good fortune of being joined by three wonderful guests who will be sharing their insights on the topic. Firstly, we have Danny DeLibetto. Danny is the founder of Ladles of Love. Uh, Danny was born in Zimbabwe and moved to South Africa as a teenager where he discovered his lifelong passion for food. He was also born into an Italian family where food was a big part of his early years. And so was cooking and feeding and making people feel welcome all seemed to come naturally to Danny and led him into a career in food. As a restaurateur, feeding homeless people seemed like a logical starting point to Danny. So powered by love and offering comfort to fellow humans who have temporarily lost their way. Welcome Danny and I look forward to learning from you this afternoon. And then we're also joined by George van der Skeef, who is the co-founder of Pristine Earth Collective and the director of Little Boom Project. John, George, is on, <laughs> George is on a mission to curb the tide of ocean-bound plastic by bringing about meaningful systemic and behavioral change. He was also born in Johannesburg and grew up in Durban and has been adulting in Cape Town for over a decade. In March 2020, George co-founded the Seaboard CAN, also for short mean, meaning Community Action Network, at the start of the South African COVID-19 pandemic to support the most vulnerable in the Seaboard and in Guguletu. Then lastly, we are joined by Kim Whitaker. Kim is the founder of Ubuntu Beds. Kim launched Ubuntu Beds to unite hospitality businesses that now stand empty with healthcare workers. Ubuntu Beds, with the support of the first RAND Spire Fund, hopes to raise enough funding through private donations and corporate sponsorships to accommodate up to 2,500 public health care workers over the next four months. Welcome, Kim. Right, so COVID-19 has triggered a seasonic shift in the way we live, as well as the way we even interact with each other. From large corporations to nonprofits of all sizes, many organizations have been forced to innovate quickly and accelerate growth during these strange times. Danny, I would love to start with you. And I thought I'd ground us in with some stats, uh, which I felt were quite staggering to say the very least, because um, according to the World Food Programme, more than a quarter of people will experience acute hunger by the end of this year. The livelihoods of 265 million people in low to, to middle income countries are severely if infected by the Im impacts of COVID-19. So with this in mind, uh, can you tell us more about Ladles of Love and what inspired the idea and how did you start? 
Um, thank you. Thank you for your intro there and your kind words. Um, so Ladles of Love was uh, founded back in 2014. Um, uh, I was on a breathing and meditation course. Uh, and a long story short, uh, I was introduced to the word Seva, uh, spelled S-E-V-A, means giving of yourself, wanting nothing in return. And uh, our Seva that day was to go and serve the homeless community uh, some food. And it just all pretty much clicked into place. For me, I think everyone wants to do good. We just sometimes become overwhelmed and not sure where to begin. So uh, it just, like you said, it was a logical approach. I had the restaurant, lots of homeless people around the city. And so we served our first soup kitchen in July 2014. Um, we continued our journey, of course. And um, just pre-COVID, we, um, we were serving four soup kitchens around the city. Uh, we were working with five, four schools and we were working with four or five other beneficiaries that we were helping with bulk food supplies um, uh, to support their soup kitchens. So we we're trying to spread our, our, our help by working with, with other organizations. And um, so pre-COVID, we were doing around a ton of food a week. Uh, we were doing about 15,000 meals a month. So we were going along quite nicely. Um, the organization was growing slowly, slowly, and then COVID uh, was uh, struck our shores. And um, I just remember uh, when Cyril Ramaphosa uh, was giving us that speech about complete lockdown. And I remember watching, uh, watching it on TV, and it was a very weird moment for me because uh, a huge calmness came about me and almost... I don't know, whatever you want to call it, let's call it a godly conversation where I just knew that I had to get out and provide food to as many people as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. uh, I had no idea how I was going to do it. I had no idea where the money was. I didn't even actually think about that. I just knew that I had to get food out. And, and I think with Ladles of Love, what I've learned... Uh, you know, I've run a business and I've run a nonprofit. And what I've learned with Ladles of Love is that you very much need to listen to that gut feel, that intuitive feel that we often get. Um, I really like to believe it's life's way of talking to you. And it almost feels as if at times I'm just the vehicle for Ladles of Love uh, that does whatever it's meant to do. And so I went out and uh, just like I said, listening to my heart, um, I just started planning to get food out. And uh, it's, been, it's been huge. Um, uh, I don't know if I must carry on with where we've been. I just don't want to give too much information if there's other okay. questions. I'm not sure. Yes, definitely. Um, thank you so much for, for, for sharing. And as you, as you were actually, um, you know, sharing the story of how Ladles of Love started, um, I was just really interested to know, and you're also saying that you didn't really know how you were actually going to take on this endeavor. And I'm just interested to know what are some of the implications and challenges that you faced and what were some of the, the, the positive that, that also came from, from, that, from that journey? So, um, uh, you know, when I, I, when I was introduced to this word seva, I remember the teacher was, he shared two things with me. He says, number one, when you perform seva in its true essence, uh, with its purpose of just giving, wanting nothing in return, there's two things that will happen. Number one, you'll always be, number as you take on more, so your shoulders will grow to take on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I can absolutely vouch for that because that's been my journey with Ladles of Love. Um, um, I really, I just went out. I decided, um, I knew I had to serve the, the homeless community first because I knew they were really going to be stuck. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything shut down, basically. The little support system that they did have completely shut down. So the so you got guys that have nothing, that have now absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So I focused on them first getting food out through the shelters. Uh, it was really difficult because the guys were wandering the streets. Um, they were desperately looking for money because it was not only food. Um, you know, mm -hmm. these guys have addictions. They, 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 they're alcoholics um, and they need money. And so mm -hmm. they're going around trying to find ways of getting money. 
So it was really hard trying to get them. We created serving points through shelters. We did the best we can. We connected with Strandfontein. We were working with one of the service providers there, providing food to the homeless guys that he was looking after. And so we worked on that. And then um, I knew the next step was to get food out to the communities, the townships and all like Mitchell's Plain and all those areas. And again, at that time, I wasn't sure how. Um, food parcels was the big in word at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was investigating food parcels. Um, but I was seeing how expensive it was, how bulky they were, how difficult they were to distribute, and how few people that one food parcel would feed. And mm -hmm. for me, like I said, I just knew that the focus was to get as much food out to as many people, even if it was yeah. just one meal a day. The importance yeah. is getting at least one meal out a day. Um, I started... I, again, I was just really, if I can just tell you, it was purely, people used to ask me, so what's the plan? And I said, I don't know. All I mm -hmm. know is today. So whatever was on my head on that day, that's what I focused on. And I just focused on today. I wasn't worried yeah. about tomorrow. I knew what I had to do today. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I started um, talking to the community, uh, to the people through Facebook. Uh, through Instagram, I, I, again, I didn't know why. I'd just wake up in the morning. I said, okay, I've got to send a message of thank you for the few donations that are starting to trickle in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, all of a sudden, these floodgates opened and yeah. literally money came pouring our way um, mm -hmm. that allowed me to just take on more and more and more every day. So um, I then started focusing on my, 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 my previous model, which was providing other beneficiaries with bulk food supplies mm -hmm. um, for their soup kitchen so that they can cook the food and give that food to whoever they serve. Because, cool. you know, you're talking at a price of at a food parcel would probably cost 15 rand a meal. I was now getting it to you, to these people at one rand 50 a meal. So there was a huge difference. So for the same money, I could send out a lot more food. So, um, yeah, I started connecting with beneficiaries and like I said, money came pouring in. Uh, I experienced yeah. a huge amount of kindness and mm -hmm. I saw what we as a community can achieve. Um, I right. saw what passion, empathy, uh -huh. all that can achieve and how we oh. began to explode actually uh, all because of all this kindness. Okay. Okay. Cool. I remember uh, at one you. stage, I'm just going to say like, I remember at one stage seeing a video of the conference center in Cape Town, Yes. just like full of mountains of food and like volunteers, like yeah. shunting down, like forklifts, lifting stuff. And I was like, yeah. Oh, the scale of this is so much bigger mm. than I have yeah. in my mind. And on the same oh, day, well, we go. The I'll, schools, I'll yeah. show you that's the scale right now. Wow. It's a bit empty because um, a lot of beneficiaries have collected. But yeah, that's, this is what we've been able to achieve because mm. of this huge amount of kindness that we... It's like people trusted ladles. And yeah. They trusted us to do the work. That's, that is so inspiring and, and so amazing too. And I thought, Kim, I'd also just invite you into this conversation. And as you already know that every sector has been affected by COVID-19. Uh, all, all over the world, we've seen the burdens of lockdowns on not only the livelihoods of people, but also in the economy, decline in services and hospitality, education. And as Danny just um, also shared his story as well, um, we also saw a massive as well. So I would love to speak to you more about Ubuntu Beds. I'm still inspired about how you managed to accelerate growth during these times by providing healthcare workers with free accommodation and safe spaces to isolate and protect their families during this time. How has the pandemic made you think differently about entrepreneurship and innovation and generally the future? Oh, yeah, I think I can definitely resonate with a lot of what Danny said. Certainly with 
kind of not knowing what tomorrow is going to hold at all, but being absolutely confident that today is going to be a great day. And Mm -hmm. like getting out of bed and being like, wow, mm, I'm not really sure what today is going to be, but it's going to be great. And we're going to get stuff done and we're going to, and, and somehow the team will pull together and we don't have money, but, but it will come. And not really worrying about the stuff that might normally have inhibited my thinking in an entrepreneurial sort of normal world and normal business. Um, I think the, the idea of Ubuntu beds came while I was, on like a five hour mopping spree of my kitchen, like rocking out to Alanis Morissette and doing an, a huge amount of deep cleaning. And I'm, and just thinking about all like the implication of the, of the, of no tourists coming for m- weeks or, or months and seeing how my, my colleagues in Europe had retrenched like all their staff, you know, teams of 700 were down to like 20. And so I could see that there was this wave of retrenchment that was going to come in, in our industry. And these are, of course, people that I know and love and care about and have worked with for, for, for over a decade. Um, and then also my parents being doctors, um, I had this acute sense of fear that, like, what are they going to do? Like, my parents were so amped to get in there and start, like, fighting the virus. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. You are both in your 60s. You must stay away from that thing. And they're, like, getting their white coats on, so excited. And I'm like, no, bad idea. And so I think, like, those two thought patterns really led me to think, well, right now, what assets do we have? We have a whole bunch of staff who who don't have anything to do and how, who, who are worried about their future. We have empty hotel rooms and we have healthcare workers who are, who are stepping up to start kind of fighting at the front lines. You know, and my, my parents kept on saying like, this is what we were trained to do. This is why we became doctors in the beginning. It was to, to serve this day. And I was like, oh, no, okay, but the whole medical fraternity must be thinking like this. So, so surely their families are as nervous about their, their loved ones getting infected. And so, mm-hmm. and so that's basically the idea was let's build a platform. We'll have a Google sheet with where if you're a healthcare worker, you can sign up. And then we have a Google sheet where if you're a hotel or apartment, you can sign up. And then in the back end, we would just map the two. Um, by by location using Google Maps and then just say okay cool there's someone like you want a room in Durban there's someone in Durban who can help and if you want a room in in Joburg there's someone in Joburg who can help and just started that way and in the beginning everything was donated and free and the the volunteers worked uh, for free the, the, the advertising agency, nice work that set up our logo. And they also mm-hmm. just jumped in and did everything. We had lawyers jump in and set up all the legal, legal stuff. Um, the, the accom- we had 147 accommodations who offered their, their accommodations for free. Um, and it just snowballed. I think by Monday morning, we were on Cape Talk. And, and then that just built more momentum and then people just started reaching out saying, how can I help? We had funders saying, how can I help? And over time, the business model started emerging. It definitely wasn't by design. It just sort of evolved, I'd say, over three weeks. We'd initially thought that it would be home from home accommodation. So that, let's say you were working in a hospital, you wouldn't have to commute using public mm-hmm. transport into a community back and forth, especially for nurses but that you could stay in a guest house almost right next to the hospital. That was our original plan. And what has eventually transpired is that about 50% of our placements, and we've now placed uh, just over 20,000 nights, and the, about half of them are actually isolation. So that's where someone has tested positive, a healthcare worker is um, COVID positive and is living with four, five, six people at home and doesn't want to go home. And so it was, it was something that we never planned. And then trying to prep an accommodation, like how do you prepare your hotel for someone who, is, who you know is COVID positive and has to stay isolated in the room for two weeks? And what happens if they're a smoker? And then like, where do they go to have a cigarette break? And then how do you make sure that there's not COVID all over? So all these things we were brainstorming like very last minute, but it came together. And I certainly I think that there was a willingness to 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 solve 
to solve the problem. I mean, we had we had team members all around the world, not even not even only in South Africa. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Cool. And how were those initial um, sort of brainstorming sessions? Because I can imagine there were a lot of brainstorming sessions trying to figure out what the next plan is. How was that initial process like of getting all the healthcare workers and also really innovating and really finding ways of pivoting? How was that process like? I think we had, uh, within three days, we had 100 healthcare workers sign up. So it went quite quickly. And we saw that channels like WhatsApp were working really well. I don't know if you were like me, I was added to about 50 WhatsApp groups within within a day or two of lockdown starting. And so WhatsApp, we realized, was a super quick way of getting people to sign up. And then as... As it was growing, we just noticed inefficiencies. Um, and I'll be the first to say I didn't notice them. I don't have that eye for detail, but my team does. <laughs> and there was always a voice on the team who would say, actually, you know what, I've noticed this could be done better. And what about if we tried this instead of that? And I think that our morning huddles uh, were literally, we'd, someone would say something in the morning we'd brainstorm it quickly by the afternoon they were building it by the next day it was kind of done Mm -hmm. so I think that ability to to kind of take multiple perspectives into consideration and listen to to a whole bunch of ideas and sort of decide and also not be too precious about failure we had a lot of disaster like we made some bad decisions when it came to technology especially and we tried out we tried out for two, three weeks. It, we could just see the same thing happening over and over again. And we'd be like, right, let's just can that onto the next thing. Let's figure out how to do it. So, yeah, the, streamlining the system uh, took a lot of voices and kind of, yeah, maybe just listening to to everyone's perspective mm-hmm. and and not being too afraid to fail. We did fail, but it worked. <laughs> All right, cool. So, George, I'd like to bring you into the conversation too, and I'm sure you've also noticed um, that it has become so obvious that the global economic system is unsustainable, and I know that you do a lot of amazing work within um, sustainability and recycling, so I thought you'd be perfect person to add your insights on, on, on this particular question. And also, I've also noticed that um, that the COVID, COVID-19 pandemic rather it also yeah, so much within our economy like we've seen um, as soon as the as soon as the lockdowns were now we've, we've seen kind of the state that our country has just sort of been in and we've seen how how flawed really you know these systems are in so many ways so tell us more about how Sinani Project and the Pristine Earth Collective has used the power of innovation and creative problem solving um, through the circular economy to support COVID-19 responses. Thanks. Um, Yeah, I I don't know about circular economy. It's a very sexy word, but what is is circular? Um, But yeah, I mean, it's been... Yeah, it's just been a hell of a journey, I think, for, for our CAN, um, which is formalized as Sinani and PO. But um, yeah, we, we've really just been trying to support both our communities here in the seaboard and GOOGS. Um, if I look at it, you know, from, from the COVID response perspective, um, just there, initially it was just really like a one-way road out from from seaboard across I say across the M5 basically and how do we start building bridges that that return from Googs to seaboard, you know and and that that really is where a lot of the knowledge sharing and um, yeah like similar to Kim we, we didn't quite have daily stand-ups but weekly connections and um, knowledge sharing platforms within the Greater Cape Town Together framework um, and between the uh, Google's counterparts, the Google Air 2 Can, um, which was founded by Pamela Sawana. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was just, it's been an absolute eye-opening experience um, working firsthand and 
with the, the community of Googs and, and just realizing how um, fragmented and, and isolated we, we sit here in Seapoint, really, mm -hmm. where, where in Googs you, you had community kitchens, you had neighbors um, that you could lean on. And sadly, as Danny can attest to, that, that wasn't quite the case in, in Seaboard. We, we managed to finally get a kitchen going. Um, at a nearby church, and it was not long till it was shut down by residents who, who didn't mm -hmm. want it. So, yeah, the, the sheer um, resilience and interconnectedness and Ubuntu that, that exists in these communities that we work with um, was just, yeah, it was overwhelming. So, yeah, and then, and then from a pristine earth perspective um we managed to to launch a, a great initiative on the, the black river on the first of june mm -hmm. so right in the middle of hard lockdown um we launched the litter boom project and I co yeah i mean everyone that that works or lives along that river at the moment just says this has been the worst year waste wise that they've that they've seen um yeah which is is Quite frightening, and, and like you say, this this pandemic and this whole period has really um, highlighted a lot of the the ills and flaws um, from basic service to delivery to mm -hmm. yeah to just how communities connect with one another and with other communities. Um, it's also shown how I mean the, the Cape Town Together framework especially has shown how um, communities can actually work together. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, so we, I mean, they, they ended up pairing up um, uh, suburbs, which, which worked really well and, and really gave a lot of suburbs, because initially the, the cans were um, created to, to support the most vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. your community and, and obviously um, uh, the homeless and, and vulnerable in Seapoint were were the first ones that, that we started working with, but um, when the partnership opened up with Google Air to it, it, yeah, just also just opened up the floodgates. And um, yeah, I mean, now we've, you know, from Google's Kitchen, which was our, our sort of central point, and thank you so much to Danny and your team is still supplying us to this day with um, produce for, for the soups and, yeah, just, uh, you know, it's become a, a real hub of, mm -hmm. of hope and connectedness between the, the two suburbs and got the Google Air to Urban Farmers Initiative that, that really shot through it. Um, obviously, in the light of, um, you know, food security and mm -hmm. food security, um, you know, and, and that's where... I get a little skeptical about, about the, the term circular economy getting, getting thrown into just anything um, because, you know, a, a, a garden is not necessarily a, a panacea to, mm -hmm. to create a crisis. And, and sometimes it feels like politicians and, and some people are, are very quick to jump on that bandwagon to, to shift the, the responsibility off. Um, their shoulders are back onto the communities to mm -hmm. to to be resilient when when there's just so much so much basic work to be done from um, food to to uh, you know to early childhood development to um, yeah waste and yeah I mean I'm sorry I, I guess I've just been been in the cold for for this yeah. whole. It. Um, George, not to not to not to sort of um, cut you. Um, I would just like to maybe take it back just a little a bit more. Um, and I'm sure I I'm really curious uh, if you could explain what the Cans Network is and, and how it sort of works. I know you touched on it a bit more, so maybe if you could just elaborate a little bit. Yeah, so, so the greater um, framework is Cape Town together, and um, I'm just trying to think how it came about. So I was. Yeah, it's it basically, it's almost every suburb within Cape Town um, has a CAN group, so Community Action Network, that then feeds into the Cape Town Together um, framework. So very early on, there was a, an Airtable um, list, which you could go on and find your suburb and click to join the WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also just made it really simple. WhatsApp absolutely 
you know, it just, just made so much of this possible. Um, yeah, and then you, you pass it on to friends and, and family and it was just prolific how it grew. I think when I joined, oh, there, were, there were not even 10 of us. Um, and within a week, it was close to 100 and it just kept multiplying. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's, and it's, it's ongoing. But, and and how does it how does it really work? So you post on a WhatsApp group. What do you how does that process work? And how do yeah. you get connected to everyone else? Um, yeah, so basically you would you would join the WhatsApp group, but when you signed up, you you basically um, specified how you could help and how you'd like to help, um, mm -hmm. what expertise teams you could bring to the party, and then. Yeah, just organically, the, the groups have, you know, there's, there's a handful of people that are very active um, and, you know, you sort of end up championing something. So I, I became like the, the liaison for, for Colette who, uh, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, you've got some incredible people within our groups that, that look after homeless, um, elderly within your street or block. Um, so, yeah, you just have these champions within in the group and i mean that's just how our can group sort of works some, okay. some pretty quickly but it's there, there was no set mandate from cape town together this is how you run the group um mm -hmm. it was yeah it was purely community-led initiatives that, that right that's so interesting i'm gonna um so the 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 team that built out that air table whatsapp integration is actually the same team that helped us with our original uh, tech. Yeah, so it's, it's, and, and it's, it's funny what you said about like, and I, I mean, obviously I, I agree with government in, you know, putting, putting in um, basic services. And I realize that this is a huge hornet's nest I'm about to go and rattle, but I've, I feel like the speed at which uh, business people, entrepreneurs, volunteers were able to, to dream up, build, execute ideas during this like crazy time. I don't know, like, I think that it's out of government's scope to be able to be, to be able to think and act that quickly. Um, like I, I, like without the red tape of procurement and three quotes for everything and, you know, being a, a vendor on the central supplier database and all these good things that just take forever. Um, and I wonder, last, last month we talked about um, impact bonds. And I think that's such an exciting thought that, that community members could step up and start solving really complex problems because they're in the communities, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. so thank that, you. Yeah, the agility of of these community um, organizations or, or groups. Yeah, you can't you can't beat it, and and I think that's what this whole time has really. I mean, especially showing me, but I think it's proven that that um, building resilience on a community level and and decentralizing as much as possible, so that the whole network. Can look after itself as opposed to you know waiting on on one central figure or more funding or whatever it is. Um, yeah, so that's good. Cool. Thank you for for sharing. And um, I would just like to open up the question to the three of of you joining here today, and um, just to talk about your journey of setting up processes, getting the right people on board, defining your purpose, defining your values as an organization, and perhaps just to share um, just learnings and insights. I'll start with, with you, Danny. Unmute. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so, you know, our organization grew from doing around one ton a week uh, um, to over 50 tons a week in, in less than, in probably a month and a half. Um, so we grew a thousand percent in weeks. Um, the premises that we originally were on um, um, 
by so within six weeks we were literally imploding and that's when we had to move into the CTICC. So we went from a, a 90 square meter premises to a 1500 square meter premises within six weeks. And um, we were very volunteer based in the beginning as we always have been. Um, to, we had to now have an organization that is like you've seen the size that is a warehouse that now needs people. You can't rely solely on volunteers. You need to now create a core team that are coming there every day, um, that are getting paid and that are committed to coming every day and that are going to run the brains of the organization. So, I mean, I was thrown into, first time I heard about it, a CRM, uh, you know, customer relation management system. Uh, we, we linked onto HubSpot never heard of it before mm -hmm. yeah we are we had to put our sandwich drive on there i mean our sandwich drive went from a few hundred sandwiches a day to within a week we were doing over twenty thousand sandwiches a day we were collecting people were making so we had to get that system because it was falling apart we were working through whatsapp it wasn't working anymore so we had to throw that onto onto crm and i knew nothing about that so it's just I think, I think what Ladles has always been for me, it's always brought people into the organization as I've needed them, um, uh, like literally. Um, so a friend of mine who I've worked before uh, from Rainbow Marketing, she's in an events, uh, she's in events, and she came to our premises in Ruland Street and she looked at the chaos in dismay and said, I've got to get you a bigger space. And, and you know, and so she got us the CTICC within, and because, you know, this, you know, I don't know about the other two of you, but listening to, to the other two, um, there was so much Ubuntu, there was so much giving it, you, you could ask for anything and you got it within hours. <laughs> I mean, we, we had the convention center, the, the sun, the, the, the Monday I was still in Ruland street by, by Sunday, we were organized to move into, into the convention center. Um, we got free media. We got, uh, I mean, the volunteers that were coming, um, uh, like Kim said, it, it was just unbelievable. And then now you just, we literally, I've never done this. So I'm like, we were talking to you, okay, we need someone to do this. Oh, we need you to, uh, we need a warehouse manager. We need uh, to, what do you know how to do? Are you not aware? Okay, you go there. You go do this. You go do that. We were literally building a vehicle traveling on the highway at 200 kilometers an hour. So we were trying to put the wheels on while I was driving on the highway. We're trying to put the doors on. We're trying to put the steering wheel in while the car's moving. That's, that's how it felt. And, um, and thank God for the kindness. Thank God for the people that connected with us that, um, that allowed us to grow the organization and not fall apart. Mm. Um, and, and I can tell you it's, it's been one of the most miraculous times in my life this year. The kindness, seeing an organization grow from this little 90 square meter premises to this uh, we're now on two and a half thousand square meters here at Grand West and just how people come together and, um, and we just worked it out. Um, it was regular meetings. It was a lot of stress, mm -hmm. say a few arguments and, and, but things happen so quickly, you know, you'd sit down, like Kim said as well, you'd sit down, you'd talk about something and it happened. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, and for me, it was, I just kept on focusing on today. That was, that was my grounding, was today. I don't know what's happening tomorrow. Today, this is what we need. Today, this is what we focus on. I don't know if it's going to work tomorrow, but today, this is what it feels like we need. We must do it. And we went with it. And, mm -hmm. and, so, and so we managed to build this organization and, and streamline it and be able to pump out 50 tons of food at our peak at the convention center. We were preparing 7,000 hot meals a day. We were sending out, so we were sending out with that. So that's about 35,000 hot meals we were sending out a week. We were receiving and collecting uh, over 100,000 sandwiches a week. Uh, 
we were, um, as I said, processing 50 tons a week. And we had connected with beneficiaries. We then started sending people out to vet the beneficiaries. So as time goes on, you realize, okay, we need to talk to the guys. We need to see, are they doing the work that they're doing? Because literally with, with COVID, you don't have time. Yeah. There was no, things had to happen now. So mm -hmm. then we started sending people out to just check on the guys that we're working with, checking because unfortunately there's people there that, that take chances. And so mm -hmm. we, and so we grew that the challenge now is, you know, as quickly as you grow, you can also fall True. as quickly. And yeah. this has been, this has been my biggest challenge is, you know, working what I, to be honest, I am struggling with what is our way forward, you know? Mm -hmm. Sustainability is this beautiful word that everyone's talking about, but I can tell you, tell me, show me where the starting point is because I can't tell you. And I've been looking at sustainability and different models. And mm -hmm. so you start working on that. And then, you know, you're, you're dealing with donor fatigue now. Now people are getting back to their normal routines, their yeah. normal way of life. So bringing in that money, the millions that we do now need is becoming a lot more challenging. So, so, so as quickly as we went up, um, we really, I mean, we we really, we really were forward planning as well. We knew that the money coming in, that this level of money coming in wouldn't mm -hmm. sustain, it wouldn't maintain. So we knew that. So we were very, very conscientious about how many people we're going to help. What are we going to help them with? Because we knew uh, I knew when Cyril said three weeks, I knew after week day 21 that he wasn't going to say, cool, we're back to normal. Yeah, I knew yeah. it was going to carry on. Um, I didn't know it was going to carry on this long, though, to be honest. And I, I fear that it's going to ripple into next year as well um, mm -hmm. and probably worse next year because I think, I think more businesses are going to struggle with this quiet tourist season. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more I think I feel we're going to see some more casualties next year. So this is, this is, and I talk to our beneficiaries and, and you, you go and visit them and the queues are still there. There's queues and queues of people. Mm -hmm. So we've really had to think out the box, our fundraising campaigns, uh, you know, working with our CRM, different working with trying to encourage people to take on debit orders, um, working with, you know, really working with what we have getting emailers out there, having accurate data that you can share with people is so important because you, you need to show people what, what you're achieving with what they've, what they've entrusted you with their money. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've, you know, we've created, you know, we, we've very strict data, updating our data weekly, informing Everyone we, you know, everyone that's on our database, on Facebook, on Insta, we've gone onto LinkedIn now, Twitter, um, Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so we really, I've, you know, I've got a full-time social media team that focus only on our social media because we need to get the message out there. We need to stay strong. You know, even though we're a non-profit, we're a business at the end of the day. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. It's the same principles. You need an income, you need expenses, and you need to make a profit. You need to put money into cash reserves. If you do not put money into cash reserves, you will not sustain your organization. Yeah. There's just absolutely no way. So, yeah. um, I mean, last month we were, if I tell you, 800,000 rand short. That's how much money we had to pull out of our reserves last month. Yeah. So it's like, it's like we're a business and you have to think of it as a business and you have to employ people to, and you have to employ good people. Sure. You know, to run yeah. your organization, people that know what they're doing, because if, if you want to expand your help, you as an organization need to expand and you can't do that on your own. It's impossible. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, can do so that's it. it. Yeah. No, cool. that's about it. Kim, any, any insights on, on, on that? Well, I mean, I know that we were the same. We were uh, sort of hurtling down the highway, building the team, uh, building the cars we were driving. And I'll say the one, like maybe two takeaways for me. The one was that uh, we borrowed team members very generously. So you mentioned the first round Spire group. Um, earlier, I mean, their team started joining our morning meetings. And, you know, we'd say, 
this tech is missing and it'll be like, oh, speak to the F&B tech team. They can help you or, um, you know, we know someone who can help with that. Let's just put you in contact. So that was really useful. And um, maybe for a few, like a few good weeks, we had uh, like a huge amount of human resource um, when they sort of didn't have, uh, or, or they probably had a huge amount of stuff to do, but they really wanted to help. Um, and so we, we found that uh, sort of getting specialist help from people who during lockdown at certain times didn't have normal work to do and were so keen to help, that was really useful. And in many cases, it was it was services that we wouldn't have been able to pay for. Like uh, even, even as a sort of like sustainable business, like we wouldn't be able to pay that kind of level of expertise. That was really a big lesson for me was just ask for help and um, and like put it out there and somehow it just magically appears. Um, and then second of all, I mean, I, I, I don't so much like the idea of fake it till you make it, but it is totally like that. Um, I remember uh, a few weeks ago, we did a reflection session with the team, reflecting back month by month where we had come from. And our now general manager, who was one of the last to join the team was like, what? You only joined a week before I joined. I thought you'd been there for months, you know? And so we realized actually like, so how did you join Ubuntu Biz? Well, Kim called me on a Thursday afternoon and asked if I wanted to help with some financial questions. And by Friday I was the financial manager. I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, so, and, and the, the, everyone afterwards thought, everyone before had been there for weeks and months, but actually they'd maybe joined like three days before, but if everyone was so keen and like going in the right direction that we didn't stop and question like who's got more authority or whatever. And so that was a really refreshing exercise was to, was to go, to go back and chronologically see like who joined when and under what, uh, you know, like under what condition and um, yeah. So that was, those are the two things that sort of struck me. Um, and as you said, you, um, in terms of processes, our pr I mean, we did a team building um, meetup in November. And for mm -hmm. many people, it was the first time that I'd met them face to face. Like I kept on thinking, I'm going to meet this person and pick and pay. And I'm not going to recognize them because I only have ever seen them front on. I don't know what they look like from the side. You know, I haven't even ever met them on Zoom. And this whole exercise was done completely for us virtually. I mean, we were working with team members from all over the country and we never met anyone. I wasn't, I was, I was out on a farm somewhere. And so like, I mean, that was the most bizarre thing as well in terms of processes and systems. Like we relied so heavily on technology um, to, mm -hmm. to actually just build out this thing that had a real physical, the product was physical. Healthcare workers were staying in actual rooms everywhere from like Lusiki Siki to, <laughs> to Pretoria and Cape Town and everywhere around the country, but we actually had never met as a team in person. So that, I think that was quite profound as well. So, so unlike hospitality, which was my previous job, where everything is about welcoming someone into your physical yeah. space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And George, how was, how was that journey for you? Uh, yeah, much the same. Hey, we, uh, yeah, um, we put the call out whenever we needed someone. We built a comms team, finance team, ops team. It was just, yeah, absolutely crazy um, at the level of expertise and, and help and insights that, that you could attract um, simply mm -hmm. by asking on the, the group. And yeah, I think we all finally got to meet each other in like September or something in person. And <laughs> it was nuts because my, my baby was like three months old when, when we started on our Zoom calls and they were often like during bath time or something. So I often had Quinn like, like here and he was this tiny little baby. And then when we had our, our market here on the seaboard, we all got together and now Quinn's like walking around and everyone's like watched him grow up on Zoom. It was <laughs> quite insane. Um, yeah. And just like, I'm like, oh, don't you know how to air again? It's like, no, we don't actually. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, yeah, just pivoting like daily. Yeah. Um, we got, yeah, I mean, my, my background and, and income was also hospitality and 
project management. So it's, yeah, I just literally got to migrate into the can and yeah, I got very operational and, and setting up all the, yeah, lots of systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All, all right. Work, which is great. Okay. This actually reminds me of a book that I, I read not so long ago by Jim Collins from Good to Great, where he shares stories and research about systemic phases that various organizations go through and how different companies make it from good to great. And I feel that especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, it has actually allowed for that space for companies to return to the drawing board and have those moments of innovation and creativity and problem solving and what was so interesting about about his book as well was that he shared um three main components and he speaks about setting of, of how to set yourself up for greatness and he speaks about um having the right processes having the right people at the bus um, and how having the right people with the right talents and the right skill set can basically move an organization from good to great so I would like to op to basically open up some time for Q and A. Um, don't forget to submit your questions in the chat box. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, we will be taking questions at this moment. Okay, any questions? Well, maybe George, I mean, like while we're waiting for questions, I'm kind of interested to know where, like how the CAN is thinking now about the future. Like how do, how do the next few weeks and months look like? Um, yeah, right now we're, I think everyone's pretty burnt out, to be honest. Um, but yeah, going going into the new year, there's there's obviously, the charitable element um, that we are, yeah, that we, we just cannot stop. Um, but, you know, there, there's been talk of how do we kind of get the contributions smaller, but, but more at scale and, and start building funds to, to really drive the initiatives that, that came out. So whether it's the gardens, the safe spaces, um, and how do we, you know, how do we tackle some of the, the systemic issues that, mm -hmm. that are out there in Google? So you know, we had a massive fire in Google Air to, um, a few days ago, and, you know, and the, and the questions were raised, why, how, how do these happen? Like every week there's a fire and we, so it's starting to, yeah, starting to address th those core issues um, and using our resources and knowledge that we, we have as our can to, to support the other can and, and yeah, build out the gardens um, and help grow the entrepreneurs in Google Air to especially these phenomenal ones. Our markets, um, we'll be having more regular markets on the point prom and bringing in entrepreneurs from Google Air too, so giving them access to market, giving them access to feedback and yeah, just allowing them to grow. So, it's so there are some questions. Um, there's a question from Candace Hrobler and she would like to know how do you practically tackle the problem of donor fatigue? I'm assuming it's a question to the, to the panel. So, Danny, you can start. Um, yeah, it's difficult. I think uh, the message I'm trying to get out now, because I've learned from COVID how we as a community can create such impact. So those that have, um, we, we need to continue to help those that don't have. Uh, for us, we've been, like I said, we've been trying to work through different campaigns and uh, we work our CRM, our, our database uh, as, as pleasant, you know, we send out emailers, thank yous, uh, all our recurring donations that are coming to an end, we try and be in touch with them, encourage them to maybe ex extend on their recurring donations. But I think for me, the message is that um, what COVID has taught me is that we can do it and that we need to continue doing it. Um, even if, if you just put 50 Rand aside, uh, 
towards an organization. All of you that can do it, we need to continue to do it. So this is the way I'm trying to deal with uh, donor fatigue. Kim? It's interesting because I also, obviously like pre-COVID was uh, more, I would say, focused on for profit. And I see the benefit of, uh, I want to say like capitalist way of thinking. <laughs> um, and, and then I think whenever we talk, whenever I think of charity or government helping, I think of capitalism versus socialism, where like a total social society might have everything sort of paid for and provided in an ideal world. And the capitalist is like fight for your, you know, every, each man to his own kind of thing. And um, I think that capitalism is a sort of tired and broken system. I think that it is probably going to reinvent itself in the next few years, maybe hopefully as a result of COVID. Um, and I think that there is a lot of work. And like, I'm so curious about business models that include both sides. I'm curious about business models where where capitalism is maybe not as extreme, where the where the where the wins are maybe like ten percent instead of fifteen percent, and where the where the way of doing business is a little bit more balanced and slightly longer term thinking as opposed to only short term thinking, where businesses start thinking about uh, you know. Uh, you got you got obviously you know planet and people and profit but uh communities around them and and that that way of thinking is always possible if you're able to have conversations with uh shareholders and you're able to say look maybe the return is not going to be super high this year maybe it's going to be just one notch lower but 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 in exchange for that, we're going to be building the community around us. And if we build the community around us, the reward over 20 years will be threefold. And I think that there are really great uh, business cases. I mean, B Corp or B Lab organizations is one example um, internationally. But I think that there are really sustainable business models out there which won't rely on capitalism making a hell of a lot of money for one person who then gets bombarded by emails to, to donate that money to organizations. Because as we kind of discussed in last month, I think the donors, the modern donor is fickle as well. Um, it's all about sort of, I don't want to say like the flavor of the month, but in a way it is like that. Um, it, you know, it might be, it might be animals one month or in people the next month or um, ocean wellness the next month. Um, and, and, uh, especially when social media is driving those decisions. I'm, I'm totally fickle like that. Like, I, which is not to say that all people are like that, but I think um, Gita gave some great insights uh, last month on that. So, yeah, um, I, I think that the world of, of like these, these problems are so interesting. They're complex and, they're, and, and, and obviously they're devastating, but they also are exciting to some people. I find food sovereignty, food security, education, like my mind boggles with these things, but it also starts bubbling and getting excited. And I think that if we can get more people excited about solving these problems, and if we can see some sort of benefit as a community to solve problems together, um, it would be really exciting. I mean, re during COVID, 2017 compared to 2019, like people in deep poverty so household income of over of under three and a half thousand rand went from nine million to 16 million so that's almost double like the whole entire system has shifted and people are going that's terrible crime's going to be rampant we're going to lose everything like run for the hills we've got to immigrate and i'm just thinking imagine if we could shift 10 million people back to being active participants of the economy like we like South Africa would be booming if we could just shift it that way and actually get, uh, you know, more people back up to spending. Like, how exciting would that be? Um, and so I think that there is always, there's always a glass. There's the, you know, the glass is either full or empty or someone's busy drinking it. 
Um, and so, yeah, those are my thoughts. Now Nettie's on mute. We've all had our turn. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, George. Any any question? Any thoughts on on that question? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Social enterprises are, are the way forward. Um, there's there's a place for for non profit and there's a place for prof, for profit at the table. But but businesses with purpose are going to survive. Um, your giants are now scrambling to redefine their purpose and to. Um, find ways to to really drive meaningful change in, in their purpose, and, and I see it especially in because um, we focus on environmental plastics from pristine. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's it's just like Kim said about marrying the two. Um, yeah, and makes sense at the table. Really. All right, um, and then there's another question to Kim from Pamela Silwana, and they would like to know how are you planning to continue your work through our second wave? Well, um, I think as Danny said earlier, as sort of as COVID levels go up and down, um, <laughs> our activity levels goes up, go up and down. So we scale down quite a lot in between waves. Um, we, we still have got um, some funding left. And so we scaled down quite a lot in between waves. And now that the second wave is sort of on, is on its way up, we are scaling up our team again, allocating more shifts to people who are working remotely. Um, we have been really active, for example, in PE and uh, Livingston Hospital is particularly um, working on collaborating with nonprofits a lot more. So we, this mm -hmm. NPO Grow series was born out of Ubuntu Beds and Quella wanting to collaborate more. So, I mean, um, as an example, with that fire in Googs uh, last week, uh, within a few hours, we were able to place about 10 people in um, a safe house in OBS so that they had just three or four days to like, pause, figure out what's happening, um, recoup, and then uh, go back and sort of tackle life again. And I think that that for us has come through as one of the real advantages of Ubuntu beds and with healthcare workers as well. Um, I mean, over 500 healthcare workers of the more or less thousand we've placed now are um, in self-isolation. So they've got a moment to pause and reflect and think and sort of have a little bit more confidence and hope for a very uncertain tomorrow. So I think that's how we are going to be going into the second wave, but then also uh, going past there and, and thinking in, in the future. I mean, if we, if we can rally together and accommodate people during COVID, surely we can rally together and accommodate someone who's just lost their home, the contents of their home, their ID book, like everything. Um, so yeah, I think, and, and it wasn't in my nature to think like this. I was definitely kind of pushed to think longer term by partners who we work with from booking.com, from first round. And they're like, this is great. Nice. This is a really great project, but what are you going to do long term? Like how can you leverage what you have now and use this more long term? So yeah, I think long-term thinking is important. Okay, um, so I think we still have some time for one or two more questions. Um, so someone would like to know, uh, you mentioned that WhatsApp was a good channel. I'm assuming that question is directed to you, George. Uh, was a good channel to communicate with your community. What other channels work to communicate with the community, especially across community, without access to high-tech solutions? Um, little word of mouth, really. If, if I look at, at how Pamela and the people to can set up their, their structures, they had um, street champions, block champions, uh, section champions, and yeah, the word and message is, spread to from the most vulnerable to the most vulnerable in, in the areas um, when and how they can access food or access masks. Um, yeah, it, 
and, and that's, I guess that's the best way is just having a, a truly connected community. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. It's, it's not a practical answer like this. Um, yeah, it's about as low tech as you're going to get, but as mm -hmm. low tech wins. Cool. And Griselda would love to know, um, firstly, she says you are very inspiring and she'd like to know how organizations can get involved. Uh, Danny? Uh, my, my battery's going to die, so I might get cut off and I left my cable at home. So if I disappear, mm -hmm. uh, my okay. battery has died. Um, so what was the question? How organizations can get yes. involved? Yes. Um, what, companies or... Or, or individuals? I guess companies, um, yeah, I guess companies, individuals, or anyone who wants to get involved, really, how can they? Well, involved? you know, I think, I think, uh, I think nowadays, or what's going on, um, companies supporting an organization, choosing an organization, and, and promoting social enterprise development, helping these organizations help people get off their feet. Um, we need to create more employment out there. We need to create more little businesses out there where these guys can can stand on their own feet. Um, so th I think for an organization to really adopt a, a nonprofit uh, and they can work together on a long-term basis is, mm -hmm. is really very beneficial. We've got a couple and it's been, it's, it's really been helpful. You know, that ongoing support where you're not constantly chasing uh, donations um, can really be helpful. Um, as an individual, you know, well, for us as Ladles of Love, we've always tried to make volunteering as easy as possible. We know how overwhelming it can be. And so, I mean, we, we try and create many volunteer situations, you know, with our sandwich drive, our soup kitchens in the city. Um, so we always try um, to get people. So I think as a volunteer, just look at an organization that touches your heart, and go and try it. If it doesn't, if it if it doesn't mean anything to you, or it, it doesn't stand out, then then um, it's fine. Move on and look for another organisation that you feel that would resonate with you. So, mm -hmm. okay, George, like any any quick insights? Uh, and what how organisations can get involved or people can get mm. involved? In, yeah, yeah. First, I mean, welcome to to contact me or us directly. Um, I'll put my email in the message bar, but yeah, it's, it's like Danny says, find something that resonates with you, um, because then it'll be, it, it just makes the whole process of volunteering or donating, um, whether it's time, resources or, or financial, um, to the cause. Yeah. It's, yeah. Set up a debit order, help out at the kitchen. Um, yeah. Take kids for a hike. Yeah, um, it could be the, the most impactful one you can get. Awesome. Tim? I would say the other two have definitely covered everything. Um, you know, following on social media, uh, sharing, you know, sharing the message. It's often like a random conversation over a dinner table ends up with the most delightful contact. And when you least expect it. And so someone will say, oh, have you heard of what so-and-so is doing? And the next thing, someone rings you on a Monday and they've got sort of the exact thing that you need in that very moment. And mm -hmm. so I guess that keeping conversations up and, and sharing the good news and keeping the energy high, um, obviously volunteering and, and making connections is, is, is crucial, but just keeping up conversations, um, yeah. All right, um, I see there are so still many questions that participants would are eager to, to, to know more. Um, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Um, I will leave um, all the links to our panelists' um, websites and social media and email addresses and so forth, so you can go on, on their social medias and check out what 
they are up to. So I would like to thank our panelists, Kim Whitaker, George Underscape, and Danny Deliberto for your insights on how to accelerate growth and pivot during COVID-19. And also to everyone who joined today's webinar, thank you for your comments, your questions, and your engagement. I'd also like to thank the superb team at Quella Women. Thank you for ensuring that our webinars always run smoothly. And I would also just like to share quickly before we go, just some learnings that I, I took from today's session. Um, what I really enjoyed is the spirit of Ubuntu. I really enjoyed when you when you guys spoke about how everything just sort of came together with you not having to do so much. And for me, that really just speaks to the concept of Ubuntu, you know, the concept of people coming together and really sharing resources. George, you mentioned how you've been using WhatsApp as a tool for knowledge sharing. Um, Danny, you spoke about how you have, you didn't really know what, what, what your next step was going to be, but just because you just were like, okay, I'm just going to take the next step and I'll take the next step and I'll see where this sort of leads me. So that was really inspiring for me and as well. And I'm sure everyone who tuned in today could really gain a lot of insights and learnings from that as well. And Kim, also when you spoke about how people were just sort of assigned roles and you know things just came together as well. That was also really inspiring. And as part of the Quella Women team as well, I've seen you know how these things have come together. And also when COVID hit, you know, everyone really, and we as an organization also had to rethink about what we were going to do next. And under your leadership and also with an amazing team, I saw how, you know, all those moving parts came together. And as Danny mentioned, it was a lot about putting on the doors while we're on the highway, you know, not really knowing what the next step was going to be, but just sort of moving and just going forward. So thank you so much for all those wonderful learnings and maybe just a few housekeeping um, announcements before we, we leave. Um, everyone just stay tuned to our social media platforms for further updates about the NPO Grow series. Follow us at Quella Women on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And we'll be sharing links, as I've mentioned, of the panelists' website and social media details on there. And you can engage with them further. A final recording will also be made available via our newsletter. So do keep an eye out for that. Uh, our next event will be taking place in January. Um, dates and all further details will be made available via our socials. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.